All right, our next speaker is Dr. Kelly Kinsher. Dr. So Dr. Kinsher is a professor in the Environmental Studies Program and senior scientist at the Kansas Biological Survey at the University of Kansas. Dr. Kinsher has a PhD from the University of Kansas and is a plant community ecologist and ethnobotanist with over 25 years of experience. Dr. Kinsher has extensive fieldwork experience and has led many research projects and has been involved in numerous landscaping and restoration projects with native plants and has published over 120 papers from topics ranging from plant community ecology and native prairie plants to prairie and wetland ecology and restoration and also on topics including cultural uses of edible and, medic of edible and medicinal plants in the Great Plains and Western US. Um, of course, uh, Dr. Kinsher studied plant community ecology, conservation of Midwest Great, Plate, Great Plains, Rocky Mountain habitats and ecosystems, and management of native plant communities and other lands. Currently, Dr. Kinsher is focusing much of his attention on collecting medicinal plants and looking for natural products and anti-cancer compounds throughout the Great Plains and, South and Southwest that help support the use of native plants for the KU Native Medicine Plant Research Program. He's author of two books, Edible Wild Plants, Wild Plants of the Prairie, which was published in 1987, and Medicinal Wild Plants of the Prairie, which was published in 1992, both published by the University of Press of Kansas and a forthcoming one on Echinacea, that's herbal medicine with a wild history to be published by Springer soon. Dr. Kinsha is one of the founders and board members of the Kansas Land Trust um, Prairie Plains Resource Institute board member based in Aurora, Nebraska, and is on the advisory board of the United Plant Savers as well. And today he's going to talk about the native medicinal plants of the prairie. Welcome, Dr. Kinsha. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Great. So I'm going to switch gears from past speaker and talk about. Uh, a whole group of plants that I hope will interest and excite you, and that is our native flora, and particularly its uses in medicine and, and also food uses, wild food uses. I'm part of a research program at the university that was originally funded by the Kansas Bioscience Authority, but with uh, funding choice changes at our state government level, uh, that program funding ended, unfortunately for us, while we're in the midst of some pretty exciting discovery. We've continued the program at a scaled down level, but uh, have had to truncate a little bit some of the work we're doing. Essentially, our program was looking at uh, wild plants across Kansas with a big focus, but really the Great Plains and, and West for plants that could be used either as pharmaceutical products or close to my heart in the natural products industry. I headed up the botany uh, wing of our program um, which was involved in the propagation, identification, collection of plants, and I'll talk mostly about that. But Barbara Timmerman at the University of Kansas in the medicinal chemistry department headed up the medicinal chemistry wing, and they had worked and continue to work on identifying compounds in some of these plants that are of interest and, I believe, uh, as I will talk about, show great potential. To work with plants, native plants, uh, particularly in the wild, really it's important to have a conservation ethic at the beginning. Uh, so that influenced plants that we chose to work with. We did not want to work with exceptionally rare plants because if you make discovery on those, you immediately set yourself up for having to deal with rarity or making something more rare. The fundamental part of our work and program has been working on what ethnobotany but essentially Native American plant lore, plant information, which is rather extensive, and I'll go into some of that. But we also want to respect the, the people who help provide that information, primarily historically, but also currently. I have worked, continue to work with uh, various tribes in the Great Plains, uh, including Lakota, Crow, and uh, the Arikara currently in North Dakota. So native prairies are very rich in plant biodiversity, and a lot of my career has been studying prairies. Uh, we have 2,100 species in Kansas alone. There's 20,000 species uh, in North America, north of Mexico. Um, 
And in, in my work, I've identified over 220 species that were used as medicine by Native Americans when looking at prairie plants in the Great Plains, and about 120 that were used as food. I think it's interesting to compare those two numbers. A lot more plants were used as medicine than for food. And the reasons for that is, if you look at the array of uh, ailments, sicknesses, and things that we have, it's really much greater in diversity than our basic needs for food. Although we do have food choices, and our food choices are increasing dramatically, it's exciting to go to markets or go to just even a grocery store and see how many new things are there, things that you may have seen in Mexico or somewhere else are now showing up, and then even locally, number of different foods that people are growing. But that all pales in comparison to medicinal plants. I was really pleased and pleased to tell you that when I wrote my edible plant book, I could tell you I tried, tasted everything in that book. Most of those plants are tasty. Some I would only describe as palatable, um, but I tried them all. But with the medicinal plant work, I've not done that. Um, you'd have to be a hypochondriac to do that. <laughs> And even if I adopted some transgender perspective in life, it probably still would not provide me with the opportunity to deal with plants that would be about giving birth or complications with menstruation or other things, right? So there's no way that anybody could try all these. And much of the medicine, of course, Native American medicine is uh, much more subtle um, than we think about medicine today and you cannot separate uh, spiritual uh, treatment from medicinal plant treatment. Um, part of my work up on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota was with an elder, Alex Little Soldier, and kind of my classic conversation with him when I finally got a seating with him and had some great documents on Lakota ethnobotany, and I was delighted because these documents had both common names and scientific names and um, Lakota names. So I thought, great, we can talk about all this. And so I said, just started to talk, and he said, so what does he really want to know? And I said, well, I know about these plants and their medicinal uses. And he says, well, I don't think you understand. It's not the plant that heals, it's the spirit. And I said, well, yes, I do understand that, but don't you use this plant to treat this? And he said, yes, but you don't understand. It's not the plant that heals, it's the spirit. And I said, well, yeah, I do understand that, but don't you use this plant to treat this? He says, well, you don't understand. It's... And I think that just shows you the, the circle of understanding. And um, so I, as a scientist, um, I, I don't discount all sorts of phenomena. But as a scientist, I believe in testing things and repeatable facts, right? So today I can talk to you mostly about those things that we can work with. Um, and not to dismiss the other part of the aspect of how healing works with Native Americans, but I feel my work honors those uses that we can look at and test today. So I just want to talk about Kansas, but the whole Great Plains. So we have lots of different ecosystems. We're prairie country. Um, you know, like 95% of Kansas was originally prairie, tall grass, mixed grass, short grass being the dominant types, but many, many variations within that, many other habitats. Grasslands are such wonderful ecosystems. Uh, the yellow areas in the global map, tall grass prairie in the green on the map, um, with Flint Hills pictures and inset, but most of that landscape, of course, today has been in agricultural production. So we're down to something like less than 4% of the original tall grass prairie is left. So another part of me is a conservationist, as a lover of plants and of a defender of prairies really wants to share information about these native plants for their value because I believe that to get engaged in protection of landscapes and conservation, it's much easier to relate to plants than some sort of concept of a prairie or an ecosystem. So I try to champion things like echinacea is a wonderful plant in terms of medicine and flowers and utility um, because I believe that prairies have great value, but we need to think about pieces of that that we can talk about. So our research is based on data and databasing. So with my work and then with help, our lab, we've, we've pretty much put in the database as many um, Great Plains plant uses by tribes that we could find. 
And so we've tried to catalog all of that, working with historical sources um, so that it is things that other people could read or look at. And we use those as leads to collect the plants that we've collected. Um, so we ended up collecting over 200 species of plants that had previously had uh, medicinal plant uses. But those uses weren't always things that um, we'd use them for today. And the best example of that, because I'll talk about anti-cancer plants, is that Native Americans did not really have much of a list of plants to use for cancer. Cancer really is a modern construct. You could even argue it's a construct of modern medicine, the pharmaceutical industry, because it, depends, it really is about thinking about cells and thinking about cells malfunctioning and odd growths that are internal. The whole concept of cells is really a more mo modern science, modern biology, not something that Native Americans talked about or would talk about in terms of traditional uses. Um, cancers, cells, you know, out of control, so to speak, it's just a different concept. Native Americans did have cancer. If you think about skin cancer, they would probably talk about a problem with the skin and would not use the word cancer. They also had less cancer, and I'll postulate on some of that because some of the foods they ate, as I will talk about, are anti-cancerous. I think they live pretty healthy lifestyles. Also, the average age of death of Native Americans before settlement was much less than ours today. A lot of cancers, of course, older age diseases, so there are a lot of reasons why there was less cancer. But anyway, we use that information as for what we go out and look at. One of the people who provided some of that information is Melvin Gilmore. He's an ethnobotanist, grew up in Nebraska, worked a lot on reservations, has written extensively. He's currently my kind of uh, uh, history uh, find of, of the year, or last few years. So I'm now delving into all of his work and looking at his original notes to glean those for additional clues on plant uses. He wrote this book, Use of Plants of the Upper Missouri River Region. Not the easiest read, but it's out there. It's inexpensive if this interests you. Because um, he had great insights and he had great respect of the people he worked with and recorded what they wanted to share. His skills were great, including uh, he wrote a wonderful paper called The Gynecology uh, and Obstetrics of the Ricora in 1923. He got the old women to talk to him as a man about plants that they used. Of course, their bottom line comment was, we really just didn't have much problem giving birth. Um, so we didn't really use much. But even so, they did talk about things they did do. He also worked with tribes directly. Um, here he is with a Pawnee elder. And he liked to be outdoors. I mean, he's a great icon for me. He liked field work. There he is camping in wintertime. This is the woman, picture of the woman who not only shared with him about uh, uses of plants for giving birth, but also was a basket maker, and, and he went to, wrote extensively about basket making. He collected plants, and the core fundamental thing that we do in our research today is collect plants for documentation, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And I've also turned his notes into databasing, too. So where do you go collect plants? particularly if you want to go back and collect them again. Um, and in Kansas, over 97% of the landscape is private property. So we went to national grasslands, other federal lands, state lands, place where we could gain access easily. Um, so some are on national grasslands out west. Our national wildlife refuges, like Quivira and central part of the state, there are great state parks in Kansas and Missouri. Um, Clark County State Lakes, favorite of mine. But in all this collection, you get to lots of open spaces. Here's the Sand Hills in Nebraska. Clip in northern Nebraska, went to some uh, reserves that were owned by nonprofits and collected there. When we collected plants, we uh, had to deal with moisture. So foggy days were not our friend. And we couldn't collect this, this day in the Black Hills because we had to make absolutely certain that the plant material that we collected was as um, pure as possible. And one of my big fears was that we would get mold on our plants and there'd be great discovery. And then six months or a year later, we'd find out it was fungus that was giving the response rather than my plant material. 
So the key is knowing your plants. Uh, I encourage all of you who have interest in plants to learn botany, to learn plant identification, um, using keys. Um, not easy. The um, best way to learn plants is to learn from other people who know those plants. So spending time with people that know those. But ultimately, you fall back on keys. And that's what we're doing here is keying out one of our thistles, or in this case, uh, wild tomatillo. So the medicinal chemist wanted over two pounds, actually wanted a kilo of dried material. That meant we needed 15 to 20 pounds of plant material, which in some cases is a lot. In other cases, not so bad. We liked big, fleshy roots, like woody material, like you know, weeds that were big and tall, dense stuff. But some plant material is pretty small. We'll talk about that. We also collected lots of data related to every collection, GPS units, everything from time of the day to how to get those driving directions, information about the plant population and stand, for that in the database. And then again, the core was we made plant specimens. You flatten out your plants, dry them carefully, label them. And in our case, uh, all of them were deposited at the KU uh, herbarium. And the reason for doing this is, A, we are wrong occasionally. So you will get corrected. And taxonomy is changing. Um, with new molecular techniques, now things are being reclassified in some cases. Kind of a pain when names change. But it means that there's probably some truth behind that. And things will change in the future. So if the plant we collected ends up getting divided into two species in the future, it would be possible then to actually look at our specimen and say which of those two it was. So it's very, very helpful to have these collections um, for future work. That's our data collection form. Not all that interesting, but just want to show we collected a lot of data. We traveled. There weren't always places to stay or get a good meal. Um, <laughs> fortunately, the High Plains is being depopulated, um, but we dealt with that. We spent a lot of time cutting up plants. To dry our plants, I had considered about taking a dryer along, and, and we thought that would be a good idea. But we also decided we did not really want to apply much heat to these plants. So instead of doing that, we sought out places where we could lay plants out to dry and use fans and turn them, chop them, or even better, bring them back to our plant lab, where we have a really good air exchange. Like in the, in the most chemistry labs, there's uh, air exchange units. will change the air in the room every two minutes. So it means that those plants don't get a chance to mold. Mold was not our friend. Not our friend. Here we are collecting a wild licorice. Um, licorice has been used for medicinal purposes for a long time. It's uh, got a very sweet substance in their root, and it's, uh, it coats the throat. So it's been used for colds and sore throats and other medicine for a long time. We also liked it because of these big, long, stringy roots, and you can collect a lot of it. There's one root, this plant in the wetland area. More time chopping. Laying them out to dry. This is a big barn we use for a while. So you lay them out and turn them. Bush morning glory. This is a plant of uh, sandy areas in the high plains, western Kansas, western Oklahoma, South Dakota. And it's a morning glory, um, but it's a perennial one. And it was a plant of great interest to Native Americans who use it as one of their cure-alls. Um, and I've done work on this now, and we've identified an anti-TB compound in the roots of this plant. I don't think it'll be something that's marketable, but just interesting that you get these compounds out of these plants. The, the belief is that medicinal plants are medicinal because plants are trying to ward off being eaten by insects or grazers. And of course, they, they protect themselves in a lot of ways. The most easy way to think about plants protect themselves are spines, thorns, right? physical protection. But that didn't always work. And, and plants evolved all these other ways to use chemistry. So you have all these chemical defenses. And primarily, they're to defend them against insects. And insects are just remarkable, aren't they, And how they'll gobble up the plants we want to grow and even evolve and change to do that. Um, and of course, we're pretty similar to insects uh, in the scheme of life. Uh, think of it this way. In our horticultural world, 
Is there any insecticide that you feel really comfortable consuming or being exposed to? You know, we, we don't. Even, even the organic ones, you know, are, you know, something you don't want too much exposure to. So even insecticides are really pretty close to uh, uh, humanicides, or, right? Um, so we, we know that some of the effects insects could affect us. And most of these secondary compounds are affecting insects, not by killing them, but affecting their behavior or how they live, like BT, you know, oddly, paralyzes the guts of worms, of caterpillars. Really strange that, you know, where that come from, but it works, right? Um, so we found this uh, uh, anti-TB plant and some work we'd done. So we wanted to collect more of it for this project, and it has these great, beautiful flowers and these big roots that it go way down deep in the ground, and Quinn went all the way in to get it, and got it. Isn't that great? Look at our trophy root. And then doing historical work, we realized that, you know, here's a Swiss botanist in 1913 out, out in Akron, Colorado, that's on the way to Denver, driving from here. He's also collected this stuff, and he's posing with his root, except he's got this little bench to elevate himself. We didn't, we didn't think about that for our pictures. But botany and exploration has been a big deal. Here's that same Swiss crew uh, out in their Colorado trip in that year. Um, odd looking group. I also realized we just didn't have hats. I mean, hats are something that botanists these days just don't think enough about. So anyway, we, we collect this root, took it back, and to, we have to grind these things for the chemist. And a big root like that gets hard, so we had to cut them up. And this plant has annual growth rings, which is kind of cool, because most roots don't do that, right? Um, trees do that, but most plants don't. So we like these big roots, buffalo gourd. So you may know this, the wild gourd. Often you see it along railroad tracks. Again, high plains plant. You know, it's, it's a cucurbit. It's related to all of our squash and those, and it's part of the origin of where those came from. Another big root, we love big roots. I had to cut it up with a bandsaw, too, before we grind it. Yucca, like yucca, big roots, too. But then weedy things, cucklebur. Um, there's medicinal use of it, particularly in the seeds. Bone scent. i make a plug for this one. Um, I just heard about the Zika or Zika virus, right? And the common name for that is uh, bone break fever. This plant was used against the bone break fever. This has immune stimulant properties and the horrible 1918 flu epidemic, which apparently originated at Fort Riley in Kansas and spread over and I think, what, 10, 20,000 people died? It was horrendous. Um, and there really was not any good medicine for it except this plant, bone set. Called bone set because it helped cure the bone break fever. Nothing to do with broken bones. That fever, and you know, when you've had a really bad flu, your bones actually ache, or something seems like your bones are aching. I don't know what that is exactly, but when it hurts when you have flu, this is a plant that was used against that, and in recent times we've identified an immune stimulant in this plant. Um, I do think there's opportunity for uh, some of our plants and prairie plants to be useful in current epidemics, and I wish there were research funds for this sort of thing. In fact. When I hear that uh, uh, the government, Obama has mentioned they're going to spend a billion dollars on a vaccine for the Zika virus, power to them, but a little bit of money for immune stimulant plants like this or echinacea, which I'll talk about, would also go a long ways because you could be providing those right now. Um, but I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, yes, it was, it was used in the East, uh, yes, and people had pretty good success with it. But it's always hard to tell with herbal uh, plants and treatments when you have historical information how effective it was and how long those symptoms are going to last, right? That's where clinical trials, and there are clinical trials of herbal products, plants are good too. So it was helpful, apparently. Lobelia syphilitica, you can kind of guess the history of its use, right? Collected this. Okay, this one, this one was very fascinating. That orange substance is called daughter, and it's a plant parasite which makes, has no photosynthetic apparatus in it. 
It only lives on other plants, and the different species are attracted to different types of plants. So this one feeds off of helianthus or sunflowers. And the reason we were interested in this, there's a little bit of research on some interesting compounds in it. And think about it. This plant is exchanging bodily fluids with another plant. You know, and that sort of thing's dangerous in nature, right? So we figured this plant might have good mechanism internally to be a real powerful treatment. So we decided we would collect it. Now, the difficulty in collecting this thing is there's no structure to it. And it's thin. And it's on other plants, which you do not want to get in your samples, because then you're going to get this someone going, wow, we found this compound in this plant. And it's actually from the helianthus, right? You know, don't want that. So it took forever to collect all of this. They were laying it out to dry. Dried quick. Nothing. It, it, was, it was a total dud. Not a success. <laughs> We, we waste a lot of time on some things. Also, our screens, we screen for, um, I mentioned anti-cancer, but we also screen for uh, antioxidant capacity, which is really a good thing for us, uh, wound healing, and, um, well, we're starting, we did start to look at digestive issues and had a screen for that, but we had to drop that when funding got cut. So we only test for very few things. I mean, people think, oh, you should test this plant. You should learn about this plant. It's way too complex to look at the whole realm of things that a plant could be useful for. And the research group we were part of uh, had lots of ex experience with uh, alkaloids and uh, a whole set of compounds in, in that realm rather than like immune stimulant compounds or other things. So that also shaped where we went with this, which was fine. So here we are at the drying rooms. These rolled up things are not uh, sleeping gear. That's plant material gear. If you are, know you're a day away, you can roll up your plants in these uh, just blankets, and they won't mold before you get back to the lab and get them dry. So we can make it back from Colorado. So this is how a lab would look after a big field trip, the second lab. And then we ground them. And that mill on the right was what we used. Had to use it outside because it was pretty dusty. And you know, with unusual plant material, you don't know. People do react to things. Lots of plants, a few people are allergic to and content, so do that outside. Had to be sure, again, we cleaned it carefully between each plant, grinding, because you don't want to have anything beyond the other one. And so this is what they'd look like. So we ended up collecting 220 species of native plants that had ethnobotanical histories, and this is our winner. Kind of disappointing. The winner was a weed. <laughs> I was hoping the winner was going to be one of my classic prairie plants, you know, like echinacea or something. But uh, the thistles, uh, I now call them wild tomatillos, since you're all, everyone's always familiar with tomatillos, but the common name used to be ground cherries. Um, but this species of ground cherry or wild tomatillo had the highest anti accident content of all the species we tested. It also scored high in our anti-cancer tests. Which, so, second round of that, we sent things to KU Med Center. Yeah. I'll talk about that. Not much. Not enough. Way too many steps to get the pharmaceutical companies. And they're, they need something lined up for them. So we're working on that. The interesting thing about these wild tomatillos is that not only are they medicinal um, and use, been used as medicine by Native Americans, the roots in particular used as medicine, but the fruit is edible. And it's a very tasty fruit. It tastes kind of like a dried craisin or uh, cranberry that's a little bit sweet. Um, they're really pretty tasty. They also have extensive use. Uh, historically, all the ground cherries uh, the green shows where they're located in the U.S. or all across the U.S. The red stars are archaeological sites where seeds have been found, and the numbers are tribes that, have, that we've recorded or been recorded to have used them historically, extensively used. Many, many archaeological sites have them as, as uh, remnants of probably food, round hearths. Where's that? Um, that's actually in the southern Flint Hills, but there'd be dozens, we'd, we quit on this, there'd be dozens of sites, even in Kansas, that they've been found at. They're really, really common. 
So really, across the range, they were, they were used extensively. Bring this forward. Um, so we took this to the med center, worked with a doctor there in their lab. Uh, the screens they had for anti-cancer showed promise uh, against breast cancer, against neck and squamous cell cancer, against pancreatic cancer. Uh, they have uh, cell lines of, uh, from a woman who had breast cancer and had uh, clean cells, and they have both of those, so it's her cells in both tests, and it was positive in that test. Uh, they do some crazy things with rats, but they were rats that have induced tumors. We got tumor reduction size. Uh, with the chemistry of this, um, the lab, I wasn't part of this, but the lab uh, patented the chemistry and patented the anti-cancer uh, find of that. More exciting to me even was that we did work on the fruits and the fruits have the compound in quantity too. So Native Americans and us today can eat fruits that are anti-cancer. Um, or anti, that would provide some level of anti-cancer activity. Now, does our discovery here mean we've got a cure for cancer? No. Uh, some of the tests show that the, the ability for it to shrink tumor size is limited in time and duration. Um, the lab's now been tweaking on this. We've been collecting other species and testing them, but nothing is as good as the Fissilus longifolia so far. There are 70 species of Fissilus. The common tomatillo that make green sauce out of that you'll see in the grocery store, um, and the small one, Thistleus pruviana, you might see occasionally at a farmer's market, kind of yellow, yellow-orange, uh, sweet-tasting fruit. Neither of them have our compounds in them, though with analytes. So there's just variation. Um, but the wild one seems to have it. So we're continuing some work on that. We're now growing it in our gardens to make sure we get the quantity up so that when they want to do more testing, we can do that but it goes slow. It's not far enough along in terms of safety and efficacy data for others to be interested in it yet. And it's hard to get funds for that intermediate step. Um, but we're working on it, trying to work on that. It's real slow. Next piece we want to talk about, of course, is echinacea. And echinacea is my favorite prairie plant. And as mentioned, I'm just finishing up a book on echinacea's conservation status and Medicinal uses, ethnobotany, um, that'll be out in a month or two. Slightly academic book, so I'm forced to be a little bit expensive, but I've written it so that it's readable. So find a copy somewhere. Um, it will be available electronically, too. So echinacea is our Kansas medicinal, meaning that it came out of Kansas. We've published uh, a survey of looking at tribes. I know about 18 different tribes that used echinacea, so it's more widely used as a medicine than any other plant in the Great Plains. Uh, when Lewis and Clark came through, uh, they learned about the echinacea from the Ricara, who used it as a remedy for not only colds and sickness, but against rabies and rattlesnake bite. And they were told about it by the Mandan and were so excited about it that on their first winter, they stayed up at uh, the Mandan villages in North Dakota. They actually sent back a boatload of goods to Thomas Jefferson. And in that boat, they sent bo back both seeds and roots of echinacea. Seeds because they had a horticultural idea too. They thought this would be an important thing for Americans to know about and grow. That'd be the only reason you'd send seeds, right? We don't know what happened to those seeds. I mean, they, they got lost somewhere along the way, although apparently they did get back to Philadelphia. They also sent back prairie, two prairie dogs and two prairie chickens. The prairie chickens died, but one of the prairie dogs survived. I don't know what they did with it, but they, they had a prairie dog, and everyone was amazed by that, too. So it goes way back. Um, Echinacea has mostly been exported um, from the wilds. Uh, the major users of it are in Europe, um, where echinacea is available at pharmacies for your colds and sore throats, sickness, flu. Um, massive amounts have been harvested. Uh, we've published a paper on the 100-year history of harvest in Kansas. Uh, that's now 120 years. Um, there's still hundreds of thousands of plants being dug up. Uh, for the market from the wild because the most desirable species is Echinacea uh, angustifolia, which is the one in the top right. 
uh, which occurs mainly in the high plains, so Flint Hills and West in Kansas. Um, most people know Echinacea purpurea, which is the one uh, photographed here, and it's the most common one in your garden. All of them have good medicinal constituents. All of them have immune stimulants, but they also have a variety of compounds. Uh, we lost that on the big grant for an NIH uh, Echinacea Center, went to Iowa State. That's kind of the booby prize. I got to be on the review committee. <laughs> you know, like funding up to go to meetings, but no funding for research. It's disappointing, but uh, I learned a lot. Um, so we still have not been able to isolate the active constituent in the carbohydrate uh, fraction of the plant. So there's a very, very large molecule in the carbohydrate part that there is a definite immune reaction to. If you take the plant material and extract all the carbohydrates and test what's left, you will get another immune stimulant reaction. So uh, we know that there's what I'd call polypharmacy going on, multiple interactions. Uh, does echinacea work? There are bunches of studies in the medical literature saying that it works and it doesn't work. You can pick whichever one you want. Um, we typically view as the gold standard, though, look, looking at clinical trials. There are quite a few clinical trials of echinacea, some saying it works, some saying it doesn't work. The thing, and I'm not trying to cherry pick here, though, when working with herbal products, you really need to be really careful and figure out what the plant materials you want to test, how you test it, how you prepare it, where it comes from. And I think a lot of times that quality control has not been there, and especially when we don't know what those active medicinal constituents are. If you look at some of the positive results that have come out recently, I love it. There was a great clinical trial looking at folks in Australia who they're looking at upper respiratory tract infections and tracking people who are making long plane flights, like Australia to the US, and would had one crew that they treated before, after, during, and after with echinacea, and the group did not get treated. Those who got treated had less symptoms and shorter durations of upper respiratory tract infections. Just last year, a clinical trial out of Eastern Europe shows that echinacea is as effective as Tamiflu. Tamiflu is what, didn't we spend several billion to give that to people for the last big flu epidemic? I think we did. Um, equally effective and doesn't have the side effects. Tamiflu has a lot of side effects. But we can't get any traction for these medicinal plants because they're not controlled. They can't easily be patented. They're in the market as herbal products. You cannot advertise about them on the label. You know, if you go to Whole Foods or a food co-op, you can buy echinacea, but it doesn't tell you what, how to use it or what to use it for. Or even to going back to my wild tomatillos, you can't buy an herbal product for cancer. Go to Whole Foods or somewhere, ask them where the anti-cancer aisle is, right? They'll, they'll take you to big aisle for, you know, vitamins, right? But anyway, we have a very unusual healthcare system that needs improvement and change, and I'm a strong believer that herbal products could really help us out a lot in terms of reducing costs. In Germany, you know, a pretty progressive place, you know, pretty modern place. 55% of women try herbal products before they go to the doctor. Why? Well, if they work, you don't have to go to the doctor. If they don't work, you still go to the doctor. It's like a pretty sensible thing. Most herbal products are safe, more education on those that might not be safe. There are herbal products that interact with pharmaceutical, problem, with pharmaceutical products. That's a problem. The doctor should tell us which of those pharmaceutical products are going to interact with the herbs that I take. That's how I like to put around. Actually, doctors say you should tell them about what herbal products you're taking. There's interactions. We need to know more about that, and people should be careful about those. Anyway, so echinacea and gustifolia, I told about the number of tribes. Long history of its use. It was the patent medicine and medicine that was used by a large number of people up in the 20s and 30s. Fell out of popularity in the 50s and 60s post-World War II. Resurrected again in the 70s with kind of herbal product resurgence, large amounts harvested, especially in western Kansas where it's abundant in the post-rock country, north of Hayes, around Stockton. People paid money for it. People still harvest it. Money is under the table, right? So 
nice little income, it's a beautiful plant. Mentioned Echinacea purpurea, there's nine species. Echinacea pallida is a real winner for gardens. It's the one that's native right here. Here's one of the diggers, went out with diggers, interviewed them, worked with them, and worked on sustainability of echinacea harvest. Unbelievable. Half of the plants that we harvest in experiments in Montana and Kansas re-sprouted, even though we dug them six to eight inches deep. Think about your yard or landscape. How many plants could you go out there and dig six to eight inches down and cut off the root and it'd grow back? <laughs> Think about it. Hardly any. It's remarkable. Remarkable. Even dandelions won't survive from that deep. Big roots. Here's an example of the re-sprouts in our experiment. Right above my fingers is where we dug it off two years before. We came back out and re-dug these plants. As I said, we could see the, you could see the re-sprouts. Wrapping this up, and I'd love to take some questions. Uh, our research, um, we have a garden uh, at the University of Kansas, actually just north of town near the airport. We grow a lot of these things. We do have field tours. We're going to have one this spring. Um, I lead tours for groups sometimes. It's a Haskell uh, Indian Nations University class. We also have a garden, a small one, in front of the School of Pharmacy. And we were delighted when it got proposed for being built that there was encouragement to do this. So we're educating uh, pharmacists and training about herbal products right in front of the food court. If you come over to KU sometime or on West Campus, it's there available for you to see, an echinacea bed. And it's continuation of the pharmacy garden on this picture here that was there in the 1930s on campus. There's a close-up of it. They called it their drug garden. <laughs> and it, among other drugs, it had both poppies and cannabis, um, which we can't even grow cannabis now for research. Believe it or not, still can't. That's it in the background, the cannabis. So we'll have a tour this spring. Date's not set. Probably May, late May or early June. If you're interested in it, um, just watch for it or contact me. And lastly, we've got a website, which you're welcome to go to. Just keywords, medicinal plants, native plants, University of Kansas. You'll, you'll find us there. Thank you very much, and I'd be glad to take questions. Yeah, so, I mean, there has been poaching of echinacea. In fact, uh, for a while, the Nature Conservancy was uh, um, going through some of its uh, reserves and actually cutting off flower stalks for a year or two, just so people wouldn't see them. People don't recognize plants, usually. Um, but for the most part, not. And echinacea and other plants are usually fairly well protected because there's so much, they're on private property, and there's not access to a lot of the stands. So that's not been a... A big issue, of course, ginseng in the east, in the big forests, which now is worth $1,000 a pound, is being poached from everywhere, including our national parks. People are walking for hours across Smoky Mountain National Park to get roots because they're so valuable. So if the price gets high enough, it's a, it's a problem. And we continue to work on that issue with a variety of plants. Uh, OSHA which is a Rocky Mountain plant, a uh, history of harvest, and there's now some nice medicinal finds about it, and it's only found above seven, 8,000 feet, and we know we're gonna have climate change and warming, so we're doing work on it right now to see to what extent it can be harvested, and it can be harvested quite a bit, but we're trying to develop protocols for sustainability of harvest. Um, we think that's an important thing if people are gonna harvest plants. I encourage wild harvest, but we have to be thoughtful about it. So, so we tried, if we had something that the roots were used for treatment historically, we'd probably test only the roots. We also, um, well, like with the wild tomatillos and those things, we did test whole plants, and once we got really interested in them, we started separating out roots, tops, fruits. So, right, so once you got interested. And, and then typically speaking, um, compounds will occur in many parts of the plant. 
but usually they're more concentrated in roots and seeds. But, but then again, sometimes they're not always the same compounds in different parts, which is why roots taste different than tops. Think about carrots, I mean, you know, right? <laughs> or think about tomatoes, foliage and fruit, right? And, you know, uh, we know there's lots of differences in plants related to different parts. The wild tomatillo fruits are edible, but like tomatoes, peppers, the foliage is poisonous. There's another reason why we wanted to use the fruits, potentially. Another common question. The other, thing, the other thing we realized at university, even though I was saying we don't sell echinacea at pharmacies, we do. I mean, if you go to CVS or wherever, there's lots of echinacea there, but it's not behind the counter. It's up front, right? It's, it's right there with the Pampers and Coca-Cola, right? Yeah. Um, literally, it's, but it's not behind the, the counter. And we, I got involved in the program a number of years ago because they realized that pharmacists were graduating from the university and knew very little about herbal products that were actually being sold in their stores. So we started lecturing it, and there's now even a class that deals with that. Yeah. Do you uh, collaborate at all with the pharmaceutical Sure, yeah, I know those folks well. And, and when we, um, if we're starting on something new and we need a seed source, or if I'm looking for locations, groups like that are, are very helpful. Anyone else? I, I had no idea. No idea. Not even sure I should talk about those. You know, it's funny working on this. There's a lot of stuff that everyone's kind of like all secretive about at times, and I and I'm not in that realm because I don't do that sort of work. But particularly with patents and licensing, there's a lot of competition, and so someone has a you know, and then there's confidentiality issues. I mean. Uh, who are that person? One more back here. Thank you. Yes. The, the well, the taxonomy is based on characters that are not always easy for a lot of people, based on hairs on leaves and stems. But Angustifolia is really our shortest species, and it does not do well in cultivation. So you'll you'll. It's hard to find in anyone's yard because they die out here. They don't like wet roots. And one of the reasons there's been so much harvest in the wild is the big markets Europe, and since it, it's too wet there to grow it, because it really likes the high plains. It likes well-drained soils in the high plains. So you won't see it in the wild unless you're to the Flint Hills or halfway across Kansas. Um, but the plants, all the nine species differ in height, leaf shape, hairiness, they also interbreed, you get hybrids in the wild. Um, we have one echinacea that's yellow flowered, that one's easy. It's echinacea paradoxa because, you know, they're also called purple cone flowers and it's a paradox. You can't have a yellow flowered purple cone flower, right? <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>